Good morning, New City Church. How are you doing? It was a wonderful time of worship this morning. Amen. Amen. On January the 1st, Pastor Kathy, she shared with us some of the things that New City Church was doing in the past, did last year. On the next Sunday, Pastor Gilbert kind of gave us a vision for what he thought was coming in the future. And today, we're going to talk about ways that you and I are going to be able to change the world. That's what we're going to talk about today. I want to read, I want to read two, two script. well, it's the same scripture in a couple of places. In, in Isaiah chapter 56, verse 7, it says this, I will bring them, if you read the context, he's talking about the foreigners, those that are not of the Hebrew nation, which would include you and me. He says, I will bring them to my holy mountain of Jerusalem and fill them with joy in my house of prayer. How many of you know we sang about joy this morning? There's joy in the house of the Lord this morning. Amen. I will bring them and fill them with joy in my house of prayer. I will accept their burnt offerings and sacrifices, which is their prayers, because my temple will be called a house of prayer for all nations. Jesus himself in, 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 in Matthew, I mean, excuse me, Mark chapter 11 said this. He went into the temple. You remember the story. He, he'd been in that temple before, no, no telling how many times. And, and he didn't do any of this. And that, this day, it just got him. So what he did, he tore over, knocked over all the tables, and then he said this. He said, my temple, my house, will be called a house of prayer for all nations. And you, I always thought about that. I always thought that meant that we were going to be praying in the house of the Lord, in the temple for all nations. And I think it does mean that. But look at it from this perspective. It also means that in my house, in this house, all nations can come and pray. All nations can come and pray. So today, as we, we're we going to talk about prayer, we're going to talk about various things that God is doing, what He's stirring up in the church. And before we do that, or before I get any further, I want to pray. How about that? We've already prayed once. We're going to keep praying. Father, we thank You this morning for the privilege, for the honor, for the wonder that we can stand in Your presence. We can petition and call upon Your name knowing that you listen, knowing that you hear, knowing that our prayers are answered, knowing that there's a cry in your heart that we'll commune with you through prayer. And Lord, we thank you this morning. Take these feeble words of mine, Lord, and stir up your people. Provoke them to love and to good works as we move forward into 2023. I pray in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. 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 David Brainerd was a missionary to the American Indians in the late 1700s. The men of mighty prayer are men of spiritual might. Prayers never die. You ever think about that? Prayers never die. Brainerd's whole life, if you don't know who this is, he was a tremendous young man in the, in the, early, in the late 1700s who was a missionary to the Indians. There's plenty of books. In fact, I was going to say this before I even get into this. I have more books in my study, I think, on prayer than anything else. That doesn't mean my prayer life is wonderful. But that means that there's multitudes of information about it. But God wants us to begin to pray. Amen? So, before preaching, David Brainerd prayed. After preaching, he prayed. Riding through the forest, he prayed. On his bed of straw, he prayed. Hour by hour, day by day, he prayed, fasted, pouring out his soul, interceding, communi communing with God. He was used by God mightily in prayer, and God was with him mightily. He prayed until there was a true awakening among some of the American Indian tribes. He mightily affected Jonathan Edwards, who was in instrumental in reviving the church in America. Leonard Ravenhill, in his book, Why Revival Terry, said this, No man is greater than his prayer life. No man is greater than his prayer life. The pastor who, who is not praying is playing. The people who are not praying are straying. I didn't say that. He said that. But I can tell you in my own life, when I'm straying a little bit, guess what I'm not doing? I'm not praying, I can tell you that for sure. What was the cause of the Welsh revival? Most believed it was the result of earnest, agonizing prayer, coupled with heartbroken humility. Evan Roberts prayed daily for 13 years for an awakening in his land. Thousands of believers throughout the land, unknown to each other, were crying out to God day after day for, for the for the. Day after day, I lost my place. For the fire of God to fall. This was not merely a little talk with Jesus, but daily agonizing intercession. Closer to our time, 
Pensacola, Florida, the Brownsville Revival. Did any of you ever go down to Pensacola for the Brownsville Revival? There are some, yep, some people did. Here's what happened. Two and a half years before the revival broke out on Father's Day. If you've never read the book, there's some tremendous books. The Father's Day outpouring, it's wonderful. Two and a half years before that broke out, Pastor Kilpatrick responded to God's prompting to make Brownsville a house of prayer in a deeper sense. They changed their Sunday night service to a prayer service, broke into groups under different banners, prayed for God to move. They prayed for souls, revival, children, healing, pastors, spiritual warfare, our country, and so on. And the rest is history. And then even more recently, a few years ago in November, the Reverend Billy Graham on his 99th birthday, Mr. Graham released what would be his last and final public prayer. And he said this, I've been praying for a spiritual awakening, and that only is possible as individuals surrender their lives afresh and anew to Christ. Mr. Graham pointed out that intimacy with God is essential with this and must be achieved through prayer. And I'll never forget, Janet and I went to Charlotte, North Carolina, and went to the library, the Billy Graham Library. And they had a video, and it wasn't this same interview, but they had a video. And of all the things, they, somebody was interviewing, and I think somebody asked him the question like, well, if you had to do it over, what would you do differently? Now, this is a man who spoke to how many millions of people, how many millions came to Christ under his ministry, and you know what he said? He said, I would have prayed more. And I was like, wow, that really impacted me. I'm thinking, okay, so what about me? What about me? We could go on and on and on, but that was in the past. And this, this is February the 25th, 2023. Wait a minute, did I get that date right? February the 25th, 2023 is not today. But February 25th, 2023 is an important date, and I want you to put it on your calendar. For the first ever, NCC is going to have a prayer summit. We're going to gather together. We're going to learn. We're going to worship. We're going to pray. The, the, the verse we're going to use is 2 Chronicles 7, 14. Most of you know it by heart. What does it say? If my people who are called by my name. The first, the, first part of that, the first part of that verse, though, is important. It says if. So what's today? It's not February the 25th, 2023. I'll just tell you. I wouldn't, I'll make plenty of goofs this morning, but that wasn't one of them. I want you to put it on your calendar. I want you to pray. I want you to ask the Lord, should I be involved in that? Don't just, don't just do it flippantly. If you don't feel to come, don't come. We want, you want everyone to come. There's no cost. It's going to be from 8 to 2 o'clock. It's going to be a wonderful time. And what I believe God is doing, it's no coincidence that he's doing it near the first of the year. I believe God is stirring. I believe there's something in the atmosphere. I believe there's something in the hearts of God's people. All those revivals, every revival in history, if you look at it and you study it, everyone that I'm aware of anyway, all proceeded with prayer. And not a day of prayer, not, a, not an hour of prayer, sometimes weeks, sometimes years of prayer. But God raised up people who were willing to take their time, come before Him, and pray. And what was the result? Many came into the kingdom. Lives were changed. Their, their hearts were altered. So today, today what we're going to talk about, we could keep going and going and going and talk about what's in the past. But what I want to do is talk about today. And in order to pray, you've got to have at least two things. And I'm sure there's more. This is going to be real simple. We're not going to get into intercession and spiritual warfare. We're not going to talk about all the different types of prayer today. That will be in our summit. We'll do some of that. But today, I just want to encourage you. And, and there's two things you must have if you're going to pray. Number one, you've got to have faith. Faith. Everybody say faith. 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 What, is, what, is this, what does the scripture say? He that comes to God must believe that He is, and that He's a rewarder of those that diligently seek Him. My translation of that verse is this. He that comes to God must believe that He is good. Did we not sing about God's goodness this morning? You have to believe. If you thought He was just an ogre, that God was just somebody ready to slap you on the head, who's going to come? No. You're not going to do it. We're not going to do it. But God is good. I believe that He is good and that He is going to give you everything you need to fulfill your destiny. That's my own translation. Sorry, I know that's not 
doctor or anything. I probably shouldn't say those things. But that's what I believe it means. He that, believe, he, he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. He wants to give you everything you need. Also, turn with me to Luke chapter 11. We're going to spend a little time in Luke chapter 11 if you've got a Bible. We don't have any, up, any things on the overhead, so you'll have to read along. Or you can just listen. I'm going to read, I'm going to read a little bit of the, of the chapter, and then we're going to talk about it. Certainly a familiar verse. <clears throat> we're not going to go through all of it. We wouldn't have time to do that by any stretch of the imagination. But in Luke chapter 11... I'm going to start in verse 1, and I'm going to read all the way through verse 13. Now it came to pass, as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, not if, but when you pray, say this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us day by day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. <clears throat> and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And he said to them, what, Which of you shall have a friend and go to him at midnight and say, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has come to me on his journey, and I've got nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within and say, Do not trouble me. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give to you. I say to you, though he will not rise and give to him because he's a friend, because of his persistence, he will rise and give him as many as he needs. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone, say with me, everyone. Everyone who asks receives. And he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will you give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? If he asks for an egg, will he be, offer him a scorpion? If you then, listen to this, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father Give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him. How much more will He give to those who ask Him? And in Mark, what does it say? It says, how much more will He give good gifts to those that ask Him? You see, you see, this, it is so important that we understand what prayer really is. And I want to start right at the very first, well, not the first verse I read, but where it says, when you pray, I want you, what does He say? He didn't say, Father. He didn't say, my father. What did he say? Our father. That's an all-inclusive word. That includes every soul on the planet that has given their life to Jesus Christ. You see, it is so important not only to have faith, but you must have the right relationship. That's why Jesus spoke so much to his father. His relationship was proper. And in order for you and me to actually have access to go before the Lord and talk to him, We've got to have the right relationship. Amen? After his resurrection, Jesus spoke to Mary. And you know what he said to Mary? He said, go, tell my brothers. Tell my brothers that I'm going to my God and your God. I'm going to my Father and your Father. It's so important that we develop a relationship with God. You heard what Mr. Graham said. That, close, that closeness, that drawing near to God is so necessary and that's what I would have done more if I was in my life, to be closer to God, to have, have a, the ability to know and come to God, know that He's going to listen to you, know that you have an audience with Him. It is a wonderful thing. It's said that no man in a foxhole is an atheist. In other words, all men believe in God when they're facing death. I have, I have a bumper sticker on my truck that says, as long as there are tests, there will be prayer in school. You know that's the truth? They can't take prayer out of school. They can't do it. They can try, but they're not going to take it out of school, right? How many of you been? How many of you been in? in how many of you done that before? I, it was a hundred years ago for me, but I've done it. And although I believe that God hears and answers for help from people that don't know Him, that's not what I'm talking about today. You and I, 
You and I, those of you that have given your life to Jesus Christ, those of you that have surrendered, we talked about surrender this morning as we were singing, those of you that have surrendered your life, to, you and I have the indescribable, wonderful privilege of having a Father that we can speak to. We are able to go and call upon His name, call when, when we're in the middle of anything, anything, we can draw near to God. Amen? We've been accepted into the family of God. We are sons and daughters of God. We have access by faith to have an audience with the King. Have you ever thought about that? If you just stop for a minute. I can come, I can come and I can talk to the King of glory. And He's listening. It's just um, astounding to me. So let us boldly come to the throne of grace. Back in Luke chapter 11 in verses 11 through 13. It, that we were talking about seek, ask, and it shall, you shall be answered. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be open. But that last part, I just can't get over that. If you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more your heavenly Father will give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him. You know what? I don't know about you. I haven't really asked for that lately until I started studying this. How about we begin to ask, Lord, I need more of the Holy Spirit. I need to be refilled, refreshed. I need to be awakened. My heart needs to be on fire. And you know who, who puts people on fire? The Holy Spirit is the one that makes us on fire. Amen? So let us boldly come. Uh, let's see. And when last week, I wanted to mention this too. We're talking about relationship. We're talking about that we must have a father and a son relationship. Father-daughter relationship in order to come to God, right? Last week, Pastor Gilbert shared that verse that says, Jesus was talking to his disciples and said, Who do people say that I am? Who do they say? Some say Elijah, some say this, some say that. And then Jesus asked them the real question, Who do you say? And for 99% of you in this room, I'm sure, I am sure that you know the Lord, that you've given your life. But for that 1%, that 1%, in fact, Guys, I know I, I don't know if anybody's back there. Can we put that prayer of salvation up for you? those one percent? If you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, if you don't know Him, if you've never accepted the fact that you are a sinner and that He that He will forgive you and come to you, I want you to know I'm absolutely. Uh, this prayer is just one prayer. You could pray it any way you want to. We're not going to pray it together like we normally do, but I want you to know. At the end of this service, you're going to have an opportunity to give your life to Jesus Christ. Uh, there may be one, there may be two, there may be three in here. I want you to understand, God is so good. We sing about it, we talk about it, but every one of these people in this room could testify to His goodness. He is faithful, He is wonderful, and it, the best decision that I ever made was in the 8th grade. I walked down the aisle at the First Baptist Church in Waco, Texas, and gave my heart to God. Best decision I ever made. Could never, ever, would, would, would never do anything different. I want, I want to make sure that we all have a relationship. You see, God's goodness is, is displayed in, in the Scriptures in so many places. Think about that prodigal son. Think about he ran off, took off, and really that story is not about the prodigal son. You know that. I mean, it's partly about that, but it's really about the father. What did that father do when he came running home? He ran and got him. In all of his filth, the heart of God is for you. The heart of God is to bring you into himself. You know why we were made on the earth? I was going to ask this question, and I'm not. You know, why are you here today? And I wasn't going to say because, well, we come to church on Sunday. But why are you on this planet? It's because God created you so that you could be with him. That's the real purpose. And God wants that more than anything. So if there is one, and the sound of my voice on the Internet or here, we're going to have opportunity later to give your heart to the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. So we must have faith in our wonderful Father and a relationship with our wonderful Savior in order to pray. Prayer, true prayer is not something we do. It's who we are. It's born out of a life that's sold out to God. Last week was our all-in service. How many of you came to all-in service last week? That's fun. Amen? That's good. Yeah, I enjoyed that too. Enjoyed the music. Enjoyed all of it. But all in, what does all in really mean? Does it mean you're committed to the church? Yes, but that's not what it really means to me. It means to me that my life is committed to the Lord 
all in. And out of that all in, I am just happen to be serving in this church. Could it be a church down the road or across the country or in another nation? But all in means our hearts are all in. Amen? That's one of the things I believe God wants. Um, you've heard the phrase that prayer changes things, and although I believe that's true, true prayer, you know what it does most of all? It changes us. Why is it so difficult? Sometimes it's hard. I don't know. Maybe that's just me. It's hard to pray. If I were to tell you, okay, you got to go home and you got to pray one hour, one full hour, I'm telling you, you go try it. Sometimes it's hard. Why is that, though? Why is it difficult? Because out of, if, if you do it the way it was meant to be, and I'm hopefully going to share a little bit with you this morning of that, if, if you do it the way it was meant to be, it's not. It's, there's joy in the house of the Lord, which is the house of prayer. There's a, there's a, a book. There's, I've got a bunch of books on prayer, but one of them is The Happy Intercessor. Well, those should be almost like an oxymoron based on what most people believe. The happy intercessor, one who's, who's joyful to pray, who's all that. God wants us to understand that it is our privilege and our honor to be able to come to Him. Amen? Uh, prayer shouldn't always be about asking God to change things. Instead, asking God And as we have His heart, we care about the things that He cares about. That's when things truly begin to train begin to change. True prayer is nothing more than having a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with your Redeemer. He's a friend that sticks closer than a, than a brother. So stop just a minute. It's just a heart-to-heart -heart conversation. I told Miss Lily is my 10-year-old granddaughter who flew down a few days before the family came down for Christmas, and I don't even know how we got on the conversation, but I told her, I said, I said, if you, she's in a new school, she's only been there a few months, and it seems to be doing fine, but I told her, I don't even know how we got on this, but I told her, I said, if you went to your classroom, and the young lady that's right next to you, sitting right in the chair next to you, and you never talked to her, and you never asked what her name was, and you never asked where she lived or what she liked to do, if you never did any of that, would you call her, would it be, would it be a friend? That's not a friend. You might know her name, but that's all you'd know. You see, in, in, in the kingdom, in the kingdom, that's all we're talking about. The Father wants you. He wants you. He wants you. He wants you to come. He wants you to spend time with Him. He wants you to, to, to do the things that, that, that any couple will do, if you will. You know, I just retired. Some of y'all know that. And so it's like, well, yeah, I don't, yeah, no, it's wonderful. Thank you. It's but it's like, okay, if I went home and I just went into my study and never talked to my wife, well, what kind of deal is that? That doesn't work. Now, I think sometimes she wishes I wouldn't talk so much. That, I'm working on that, baby. We're working on, we're working on that. So we're, we're adjusting, okay, especially in the kitchen. I think it should be done this way. Anyway, we won't go there. We're, we're, we're working on that, I promise you. I promise you. But, but the truth is, in Luke chapter 11, it says, Our Father, which art in heaven. So first of all, He's got to be your Father, which art in heaven. Hallowed be your name. The way to come is come and worship. I don't know about you. The way, when we pray at home, Janet and I sometimes, we'll put on, you all may have heard of Dappy T. Keys. Piano, plays piano. Sometimes we'll do that. Music helps. Worship helps. Come to Him. Hallowed be your name. How great is the name of Jesus? How much has He done for you and me? How much has He done in, in every one of our lives? Hallowed be your name. Your king, the next, but the next part's very important too. Because when I pray normally, here's my prayer. Lord, I thank you for today. Thank you for my wife. And then I go down my list. Uh, do you, maybe you all don't do that. Lord, touch this person. Help that. Touch me. You know, my knee hurts. Whatever it is. You know, my toe, my big toe hurts. I don't, and I, I'm not being flippant, but truthfully, much, well, man, I'm being a lot more honest than I realize. M much of what we pray for is about us. But when, the, when, when Jesus taught them, when Jesus said, this is how you pray, he said, what did he say first? Your kingdom. The kingdom must be first, y'all. The kingdom has to be first. The kingdom must be the forefront of what we're praying for. Out of that, 
out of that out of that prayer there's there's times to make petition and supplication but god wants you and i first of all the first thing you pray for is not your aunt down the road even though i know she's hurting it's lord your kingdom what's going on in the kingdom what's going what are you wanting how do you want me to do this I, I'm, I'm always amazed david said it this way one thing psalms 27 verse 4 one thing i've desired of the lord and that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in His temple. It's one of my favorite psalms. To behold His beauty, but also to inquire in His temple for the things that are on the heart of God. I really believe that true prayer, if I had to sum it up in a very small thing, would be, it would be coming to God, finding His heart, finding what's on His mind, Praying it into existence by the words that you speak. It's really not complicated. It's not difficult. Now, I, I said that wrong. It is, to me, it's not complicated. Sometimes it can be difficult. Just because it's so different from the way we think. We want to fix everything ourselves. But David had it right. I want to do one thing only. I want to dwell in the house of the Lord to behold your beauty and to inquire in your temple. Amen? Uh, mostly in Peachtree City, but occasionally here in our times of worship. I can't tell you, I sit on that side, I stand on that side in Peachtree City, and I'm standing there, and we're singing, and we're, 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 you know, the Lord begins to move, and I can't tell you how many times somebody, somebody in my life will come before my mind, and I'll begin to pray while we're singing. I know when we're supposed to be singing, you're supposed to sing, but i got to tell you, Sometimes that just comes on me. Maybe it's for my sister or my, my, my brother. Maybe it's for my, my children or my grandchildren. Something, sometimes it just comes upon me. And all I can do, I begin to pray normally what's in the song. Half the time, that's what I'm praying. But God wants us to, to do that to, as we're worshiping, as you open your heart. See, one of the things I said earlier, it's a heart to heart. You know, every prayer meeting that I've ever been in has to start somewhere. And when I start one, if I ever start a prayer meeting, start a prayer time, first, the first prayer is like, Lord, you know, it's coming out of my own being, whatever I've got. But what I want to do, what my desire is to tap into God's heart. Because when you tap into God's heart, number one, you know it's His will. And number two, it, what does it say? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's going to be done. When it's his heart, it's going to be done. And you say, well, how, how do we do that? Well, I mean, what, what, what about that? How, how, how does it happen? And for me, it's a matter of just day by day, keep coming. Pastor Gilbert said this morning, you know, have you noticed if, how, the more you're in the Word, the more it opens up to you? You notice that? Yep, yep. The more you study. My wife is a great example of that. We start sharing sometimes. Close yours, babe. No. She, I can't get her quieting down. She'll start talking about all the things God's doing, spoken to her, and all these different things. I'm joking. It's a wonderful thing. God, God, but when you, the more you're in it, the more God does. Same thing in prayer. You see, men and women who know God, they pray. All the, all the, men's, all the men that, and women that I, are men that I mentioned earlier, those, those that brought revival to their lands, all of them had a life filled with coming to God calling out on different things, different years, different ways. Don't be religious about it. You can pray on your knees. You can pray on your chair. You can pray in your, in your shower, right? Pray, how many of you have done that? I've done that. Can you, you can pray in your car. Don't, don't be religious. God wants us, though, to come. Amen? How, how, so how do we know what His agenda is? How do we know to pray regarding His kingdom? How do we know? There's two, two ways here, too. One is to study His Word. One of the things you can do is you can take a verse and you can take that verse and you can just begin to pray it. You know, I just, I can't, I'm trying to think of one exactly. You know, ah, I got one. Psalms 27, 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Lord, how much do I need light? God, give me your light. Send your light to my sister, to my brother. God, you know, we can pray. In the Word, you can call upon Him and use the Word of God to, to structure, if you will, your prayers if you don't know what to pray. Lots of times it's tough. How do you pray? What do you, you don't know what to do. That's a great way to do it. And the more you're in the Word, the more you'll be able to do that. Amen? And secondly, the other thing, 
When you're praying, how do you know what's in the heart of God? You listen. You know, you listen to the Holy Spirit. That takes time. You've got to be quiet. Because, you know, if, all, if my normal prayer time, it's guess who talks all the time? Me. And I'm thinking, okay, if it's just me talking, that's not, that's not, that's not a conversation, a heartfelt conversation. That's a lecture. Now, I'm not trying to lecture God, and I'm not saying that's wrong to come before him and ask things, but I'm just saying we must, as we develop in our walk with God, as we, list, as we begin to, to grow, he, Pastor Gilbert mentioned the next step, next level. You know, there may be some resistance, I can assure you. I don't know about you, there's all kinds of resistance. My flesh says, it's time to eat. I don't know about you, it's time to eat. That's okay. It's okay. God's calling us. God's drawing us. So listen to the Holy Spirit. The Lord loves to speak to His children that are listening attentively. Attentively, A heart-to-heart conversation includes two people communicating. The Bible says, Be still, listen in quietness and in confidence shall be your strength. And then thy, thy will, we talked about thy will be done. Go with me to Philippians chapter 4. We're going to look at verse, just a couple more things I want to go. And then we're going to do some other things in our service today. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. This one just struck me. You could, you could have a hundred verses on prayer that we could talk about. I've only picked a couple of them, but I want, you to, I want to encourage you. Verse 6 and 7 of Philippians 4. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding will keep your hearts and your minds. The New Living Translation says it this way. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Now, see, I like that. D- be anxious for nothing. Okay, let's, how about this? Don't worry about anything and pray about everything. How about we say that together? Don't worry about anything. Pray about everything. You see, if you're worried about your family or worried about your finances, or your job, or your church, or whatever it is. Hey, don't, don't, don't just go yak, yak into whatever. Don't worry. Don't, don't worry about anything. But guess what do? Ask Him. Talk to Him. Lord, my heart is hurt over this situation with my family. My heart is hurt over this situation at my job, or whatever it is. I love that, though. Don't worry about anything. Pray about everything. Tell God what you need. Thank Him for all He's done. And then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Pray about everything. Now I know we live, we have to do things. The Scripture also says pray without ceasing. And I'm like, okay, I'm I'm a real practical guy. But the reality is, the older I get the less I seem to know. Not the more. I wish it was the more. But I realize the less I really know and the more I really need help. And I'm not just talking about, well, you get a little older physically. I'm talking about just in life. And, and the, the, beauty, the beauty of it is we have, we have the, the, the God of the universe that's willing to speak to us and, and, and direct our path and show us the way, and heal our bodies, and, and, and help us to walk in faith, help us to develop that relationship. He is right here, right now, for you. And that's the most wonderful thing in the world. Jesus wants you to be with Him. You know what? Uh, let me read this one more thing. Luke chapter 6, verse 12 and 13. One day, soon afterward, Jesus went up to a mountain to pray. And he prayed to God all night. And at daybreak, he called together all of his disciples and chose 12 of them to be his apostles. So this is Jesus. This is not David Brainerd or John Knox, whose cry was, Give me Scotland or I'm going to die. Or Billy Graham. This is Jesus himself. He went out in the wilderness, was tempted. But this time, he went up to a mountain to pray. Now, why do you think he spent all night? I think there's a couple of reasons. Number one, I believe he loved being with his father. You've got to understand, he loved his father. He loved being with him. That's what prayer is all about, 
It's not, it's not just about asking for things. It's not about, about getting things. It's about being with the one who loves you so much. I think that's one reason. But there's another reason, I think. I believe. I'm not sure of this, but I believe this. He spent all night in prayer. Then what does it say? The next morning, he went down, gathered all the disciples. There might have been 30 of them. There might have been 50. There might have been 13. There might have been 100. I don't know. And he chose 12 of those. And those 12 literally changed the world. Jesus himself went to the Father so he could get direction. He didn't know which 12. I don't believe he knew that until that day. I mean, he had, there were other people following. And those 12 men, because of those 12 men, you and I are sitting here today. You understand that. Now, I understand it went through a lot of iterate, a lot of years in different places. But those men spoke to somebody who came to Christ, Peter, on the day of Pentecost, 3,000. And then from there and from there and from there until somebody told you about him. You see, it, when you're making a major decision, I don't, th I don't think you ought to do it flippantly. I don't think you ought to change churches just because you, you're a little bit upset about some little something. I don't think you ought to change jobs just because there's $10,000 more on your salary. I really don't. I'm not saying don't do it. I'm just saying you come to the Lord. Lord, is that really what you want? See, it's a, Jesus, he wanted to pick the right guys and of all the people that he picked, you think about it. A bunch of fishermen and now fishermen are great. Now don't get me wrong, but but they're pretty hard. They're pretty I've been with a few fishermen and anyway, they'll make your ears curl when they talk. So sorry. I'm getting I'm getting off point here. So anyway, my point is come to him. Jesus spent all night and then he went forth and did that. It's an amazing, amazing. First Timothy 2, 1, 1 says, says, I exhort therefore, first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all that are in authority. And then we're going to look at one last passage in James chapter, James chapter 5. In James chapter 5, it's a very familiar passage again. But I want to encourage you to listen to the words of, James, who is the brother of Jesus, who wrote this book. And in verse 13, he starts out, he said, Is anybody among you suffering? Let him pray. You're suffering, pray. Anybody cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Anyone among you sick? Call for the elders of the church. Let them pray. Anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick. And the Lord will raise him up. And if he's committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. Now, we always think of Elijah. I don't know what you think. I think of Elijah as a, you know, he's way up here. He's a mighty man of God, but he was just like we are. You know, Elijah had a calling in his life. You have a calling in your life? I think so. Elijah had a, a destiny that he wanted to fulfill that God had called him to do. It's just like you. He was flesh and blood just like we are. It says that Elijah prayed. Let me find that place. Elijah was a man with like nature as ours. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. Now, I've prayed many times. Lord, would you give me some rain? I got a lot of plants. I need those plants watered. A little bit. Elijah's prayed that it would not rain. Three years. If you've ever been in a drought for three months around here, drought in Georgia, three and a half years, no rain. But the, 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 it was for the kingdom's sake. It was God's want. It's what God wanted to do. And then he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced fruit. You see, God is calling New City Church, I believe, to a new day. There is something going on. And the question is, will you, will I participate with Him? I know we're serving in many areas. I know we're, we're doing many things, and those are all wonderful. But the closer we draw to God 
on our individual basis. The closer you come to Him, the more that you come out of your life, fruit that will, that will change people's lives. I really believe if you, if you ask me how we could actually change the world, certainly everything we do, you give a cup of cold water in my name, it's not going to be forgotten, and I understand that. City bridges, all the works we're doing, all the things we're doing, they're wonderful. But I'm telling you, the spiritual work that's inside of, that needs to be done inside of men, inside of women, to change our nature, to transform us from children of darkness into children of light, really only comes one way, and that's by prayer. People praying, people seeking the Lord. And so I want to not only encourage, I want to challenge you. You know, there's a million examples in the Scriptures Hannah cried out to God for years, with, couldn't have a child, for years. And God answered and brought us Samuel. Hezekiah was the king of Israel. Sennacherib came and they were going to destroy the land. The, the forces were, uh, there was no competition at all. The Assyrians would have killed Israel for sure. What did Hezekiah do? He took that letter. He went into the temple, went into the house of God. He spread it before the Lord, said, this is what he says. What do you say? And the prophet sent the word. You don't even have to fight. I'm going to take care of this. You see, God wants to move. God wants to speak. God wants to do in our lives. Help us. Develop us. Bring us in a, new, uh, 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 a renewed sense of communion with Him. A renewed sense of, of being a son or a daughter. I love... I was going to say, I love, I love times of prayer and fasting. That's one side of me. The other side says, I hate fasting. Okay, I love to eat. So I don't really like fasting. But on the other hand, and never. Some people get these wonderful revelations during a time of fasting. You know what I get? Nothing. Nothing. Just nothing. And that's just, I'm not, and I'm not expecting necessarily to get anything. But I, but I know that God sees what we do, you see. It's a heart-to-heart -heart thing. Lord, I'm here. I'm here with you instead of in the kitchen. And I love being with him. i got to tell you. i got to tell you that. I do get to do that. And that's wonderful. To be with the King of glory. To hear him speak a word in your heart. To see him do something in your life that you needed done. It's more, more wonderful than I can even express. Ex I can even describe to you. And you know, a, a message on prayer wouldn't be too much, wouldn't be appropriate, I didn't think, without having a time of communion.